Hey church, and good morning and welcome to worship. If you're a guest with us today, we are so excited to have you here. We're gonna take a moment to talk about a few things happening here at Crossroads. As you walk through the foyer this morning, you hopefully saw important tags hanging on the wall uh, inside of our foyer. That is for an important ministry that we support year in and year out, and it's an Adopt-A-Family program. We hope that you will return to the foyer after service Grab one or two tags. If your life group or family would like to adopt more uh, than just a few tags, please grab as many as you would like. Look at the items that are, are there for us to donate back and bring those items with those tags, very important so they get to the right place, uh, soon. We appreciate your support for this important Adopt-A-Family program and really look forward to that ministry every year. As you know, Little Lambs and Sunday Night Live will soon be having their program. If you have a child in those activities, you can find details about Saturday's practices coming up in our bulletin. One week from today, Sunday Night Live and Little Lambs will perform their annual Christmas program. Those details for that six o'clock event are in your bulletin as well. We hope that the church will support these young people and their families as they gather for this important Christmas tradition. Coming up on Tuesday, December 12th, is the Women's Ministry Annual Christmas Event. You can find more details about this occasion in your bulletin, but I do know that they'll be making crafts and enjoying fellowship as they kind of wind down a year of growth for the women's ministry. So be sure to check that out. Finally, we know that the Christmas season is a big, important time to invite family and friends to church. And studies show that folks are more susceptible to being invited and coming to church during this important season. We hope that you will prayerfully consider inviting friends and family to our Christmas Eve services. This year, Sunday, December 24th, is of course Christmas Eve. We will be having two services that morning 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. and then a candlelight service at 4 o'clock p.m. Again, that's Sunday, December 24th, and we hope that you'll keep that in mind as you continue to invite friends and family here to Crossroads throughout the month of December. That's it for this week. We hope that you enjoy worship.
Good morning, everyone. Hey, if you're a guest this morning, we're super glad that you're here to worship with us. Uh, last week, uh, we, we've been in the middle of this, re- we are in the middle of this Revelation series, the last book in the Bible. And there's all kinds of different thoughts out there about what Revelation is and what the end times look like. And uh, we have settled on the idea right from the very beginning uh, that Revelation is not for prediction, it's for preparation. We're not predicting how it's all going to end. We're not trying to put all these pieces together. Uh, We're preparing, and we're preparing ourselves to meet Jesus. And that's the whole point of Revelation. As John writes to some of these early churches, he's preparing them for the someday when they will meet Jesus. In the middle of all the difficulty of their life and the things going on, he writes them about this revelation that God has given them. God has given him to prepare them, as well as to prepare us. Last week, Justin stepped in, uh, and he introduced us uh, to one of the main characters, but not the winning character, uh, the enemy, Satan himself. And he introduced us to this dragon uh, that shows up at the manger scene, that Satan uh, was at the manger scene. And uh, last week, if you were here, you read about this moment when Jesus is born where Satan tried to snatch her up and or snatch him up and it just didn't work out because of course God wins. And so Satan is defeated and Justin did an awesome job breaking it down what it looks like to have an enemy in this world and that there is spiritual conflict going on for your heart all the time. As we take a step forward from that, knowing that there is an enemy, knowing that Satan is out there, knowing that he's trying to devour and to trick us, as we move ahead from that, here's what we need to know, that knowing that there is an enemy means that there is going to be great difficulty. There is going to be difficulty in this world until Jesus makes things right. That's the way that it works. Satan messed things up. And because Satan messed things up, there's going to be difficult times, both, both personal struggles, corporate struggles. There is going to be a constant tension uh, between the church and culture. It's always going to be there. It's almost as though we're living in the fall apart. Right? Things fell apart after Satan got involved, and we are living in that fall apart. But not just knowing that it's happening, recognizing where it happens is the biggest, the biggest way for us to move past it. Knowing that there's an enemy, and knowing that it, that enemy creates difficult times. What do we do in those difficult times? How do we recognize, better yet, how do we stay faithful in those difficult times? I want to pray, and we're going to answer that. Uh, Father, I'm thankful this morning. I'm thankful for your church. I'm thankful we can be here. And God, if this is our first time here, our first time here this week, uh, God, I pray that we're here to learn and God, figure out a little bit more of who you are. And God, as we look at your word and we study together, I, I pray that our goal in this is to see you more clearly. And to see what you're doing, to see what you're preparing us for, to see the truth of your word, even when it is a little bit uncomfortable. Father, I pray that you meet us in this place right now. Father, that you teach us that your voice is the loudest in the room. God, I'm thankful this morning. I'm thankful this morning that because of your grace and mercy, we can be here. We can learn. God, as imperfect people, and God, we can celebrate who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So I brought some friends with me this morning. All right. I know you've all been waiting, wondering what the. Uh, I know. I also know that last week Justin had a toy dragon, and I brought puppets. I don't know what that says about us, uh, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Uh, so I brought some friends this morning. Uh, I had to bust them out of storage; they were locked up. Okay. Uh, this is a participation. You are going to answer this out loud. Okay. Did any of my friends this morning? Okay. Did they sing? Okay. When we sang. No. Okay, good, good. Did any of them shake your hand when you walked in? No, especially this guy. He doesn't have hands, okay? No, they, they didn't shake your hand when you walked in this morning. Okay? Did, they, did they participate when we took up our offering? No, if they did, we'd have way more puppets up front, all right? 
No, they didn't participate. It did, did any of my friends here this week, did they sin this week? Nope. No, no, they didn't. Okay, they were in a storage box. Okay. No, they didn't. <laughs> no, they, di- they didn't. It, did any of them, did they get in trouble with their parents or did they get in trouble at school this week? No. Did any of them fight with their spouses? No. No. If they didn't do any of those things, because they're lifeless, right? Yes. Yes, they're lifeless. <laughs> this guy's not going to come alive mid-sermon. Don't worry. All right? They are lifeless. Okay, so no, they could not do any of those things. They didn't participate in any of those things with us. Why? Because a puppet doesn't come to life until we give it life, right? When this puppet comes alive, okay, is when it gains a master, all right? And then he can talk to you. That's when he gains life, right? Up until this point, this puppet just sat here on the table. But now it can move around and it can talk and it can dance, you know, all those things because my hand is in it. It has a master, That's when it gains life. That's when all of these puppets gain life. And it's not until until we pick them up and begin to wear them do they start doing anything. But when we do, okay, when we do, that's when they gain life. Justin introduced us to Satan, okay, the dragon. He introduced us to these beasts in Revelation. For a lot of us, as we continue in Revelation, we look at the next three or four chapters together. Satan is a lot like these puppets. You see, Satan is trying to get you to pick him up and put him on. Satan is trying his hardest to deceive and to trick And to lure you in to picking it up. And for all of us, that looks different because he knows, he knows how to lure us. He knows what is a temptation for some of us that others don't care at all about. And and Satan, he he sits in our lives and, and he tries, he says, come here, just try it on. Just try it on. Just give it a little bit of life once. Just try it once. You see, Satan is is trying to get us to pick him up. And when we pick him up, life becomes difficult. When we pick Satan up and we give life to the puppets of temptation and we give life to the puppets of struggle and we give life to the puppets of the world, what it does is it steals our life. The more that we pick up the puppets of Satan, the more we lose our lives. And in the next couple of chapters that we're going to read a couple bits and pieces of this morning, in the next couple chapters, God is revealing to John that he's passing on to the churches what happens when we live lives holding puppets. And for some of us today, for some of us today, we would rather not talk about this. Think about, I don't care about talking about puppets. Okay, that's fine. But for some of us, we're currently holding puppets. We're holding puppets of sin and selfishness, and maybe no one else knows about it. For some of us, we've picked up the puppet that Satan wanted us to pick up. And we're filling that void in our life that feels good. We're blending in with culture in just the spot where he wanted us to blend in. We look like the world at just the right point when he said, give me life. And some of us this morning are wearing these puppets. Some of us this morning, we live with people who are wearing these puppets. Some of us, we work with people who are wearing these puppets. The puppets of Satan that lead us into 
difficult times. And as Satan tries to lure and tell us, pick them up, pick them up, pick them up, when we do, it causes great difficulty. And Satan will use society and he will use culture to gain great amounts of attraction to get a whole bunch of people to pick these puppets up at the same time. And really the goal, the goal in all of it is to steal our worship. That's the goal. Because if, if Satan can get us focused on the selfish things in life that we're doing, you know what we're not doing then? We're not worshiping. If, if Satan can distract us with things that are about us, it means that our life is not about Jesus. And sometimes Satan is not trying to get us to fall into some deep, dark sin. Sometimes he's just trying to distract us enough to look at him instead of looking at Jesus. And when that happens, friends, we don't have an enemy just to have an enemy. We have an enemy who desperately wants to win to wreak havoc on your heart and soul. And if we spend our lives holding on to puppets, it's not going to end well. It's not going to end well. If you brought a Bible this morning, go ahead, we're, go we're still in Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 14. It'll be on the screen. You're welcome to look it up on your phone if you'd like. Revelation chapter 14, we're going to begin in verse 6, and we get a picture painted for us by some angels of what this is going to look like if we live life holding on to these puppets. Beginning in verse 6, it says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God! And give him glory, because the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the springs, and the water. Okay, so angel number one is kind of this introduction, this warning of saying, listen, you need to fear God more than all of these other things around you. Angel number two, verse eight. So the second angel followed and said, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. We'll learn about that here in a few minutes. Third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, okay, meaning Satan, and its image and receives the mark on their forehead or their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels of, of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image. Or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. And then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. I know most of you woke up this morning. All right, and as you were getting ready for church, I know that, I'm just guessing, okay? I know that probably most of you thought, you know what I really hope we talk about today? God's wrath. I know, I know, friends. I know that's probably why you came this morning. I know you're really excited to hear about words like torment and fire and burning. Like, I know that's what got you out of bed this morning. You're like, oh, there's so much hope found in wrath, right? No. No, we probably didn't wake up with that on our minds. We probably didn't look forward to talking about that. And most of the time when it comes to this idea of God's wrath, we kind of breeze by it and we say, well, but he loves us, right? But we just kind of skip on by it because it's really uncomfortable to talk about. But the truth is, as God is revealing this to John, and John is writing this to the early churches, there is a real reason that this is in here. Because there is real punishment for puppets. And sometimes we try to sugarcoat this, and sometimes we try to gloss over it, and sometimes we try to pretend that it's not even here. We almost justify our, our way, you know, saying, well, it's the smallest of all the puppets. Right? 
It's not that big of an issue. It's not that big of a sin. I'll just wear it right now. No one else knows about it. It'll be comfortable. There is punishment for puppets. And God reveals this. Which is why the first angel says, listen, you need to fear God more than anything else. And not in a, he's going to come with wrath and punish you. But with the reality of, that God has wrath and brings justice to the injustice of the world. And the recognition that God is just. And he does bring punishment for the things that are outside of who he is. Which means if we're holding on to the things that are outside of who God is. It won't be pretty. And so some of us think, well, wait a minute. I mean, I thought God loves us and gives us grace, and he does. He sure does. But he also desires for us to trust and love him. He also desires that we follow what he wants. He also desires that we desire him. Sometimes it's almost easier to think of God without wrath, right? But if I'm going to be honest this morning, I'm glad that God has wrath. And here's why. Because there are some injustices in this world that you and I, we cannot bring justice to. But I'm glad that God will. I mean, I hope people find Jesus ultimately. But I'm also glad that God will bring justice. I'm glad that God will bring justice into the human, tra human trafficking world in different parts of this country and around the world. I'm glad that God will bring justice in the areas where adult men are stealing young, innocent girls and turning them into sex slaves. I'm glad that we have a God of wrath. There are there are slavery, there is slavery around our world where people like you and me, created by the same God, are tormented and tortured just because of who they are. An injustice that I can never bring justice to, but I'm glad that God has a, is a God of wrath. You see, there are injustices in this world that I cannot bring justice to. There are things in this world that are so terrible and so wrong and so far outside of what God is. I'm glad that at some point there will be an answer. There will be justice because I can't bring it. I'd love to, but it's not my place. But it is God's. And there will be people that are holding puppets that have hurt and tormented kids and adults that will see the punishment for their puppet. You see, I love the song we sang right before this. Because we sang the words out loud together, God's wrath was satisfied. You see, when we set down the puppets and we pick up our cross, God's wrath begins to disappear. When we begin to follow Jesus, more than the temptations of this world, the puppets of this world, all of a sudden, the wrath doesn't seem to show up there because all of a sudden you and I, we are known by the blood of Jesus and not the puppet that we held on to. You see, for these early churches, these early churches, Satan, he would try to use big swings. Hey, he would try to get big groups of people to shift. And so he would use cultural trends and he would use the society that they lived in. And when he, Satan would try hit, to get a whole bunch of people to pick up these temptations and then push them against the church. You see, this early church constantly faced persecution from the land that it lived in. It constantly faced difficulty because of their faith. And it was in those moments where they had to be reminded they had to be reminded, and like it says in verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God. Friends, we live in a culture that Satan is trying to take big swings at. 
And it is during these times where we don't blend in and we don't step in. It's during these times where we patiently endure, knowing that God is good, knowing that God is just, and knowing that God is right. We patiently endure his commands and we remain faithful to Jesus. And it won't be popular at times, and it will stand outside of cultural and societal norms. It won't make sense to people we work with. It will look different than the people that we grew up with. But it's in these moments where Satan tries to take big swings in our culture that we patiently endure, and we remain faithful to Jesus. From the end of 14 all the way through the beginning of chapter 17, there's this explanation of God's wrath. And it is how God's wrath plays out and pours out. And then in verse 17, or then in chapter 17 of Revelation, we are introduced, reintroduced to one of the biggest players during this time period that still is at work today. So we've got God's wrath, and it plays out. And then in chapter 17, in verse 1, it says this. One of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters, with her kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, covering blasphemous names, and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things. And the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great. The mother of prostitutes. And the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people. The blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. First thought is, what on earth is going on? The second. The second is, as John is writing. John is describing the government pressure and societal structure that these people live in. And I I don't want to be crass, but I want to accurately teach what is written here. The NIV, the NIV pretties this part up a little bit. They, They call her the great prostitute. But the way that it was written in explanation was the great whore. And, and that word's a little bit more uncomfortable. That word, it, it just doesn't sit well, especially in church, right? Like, oh. But that, that's the level of uncomfort that society was and the government was for these people. And what she does, the way that he writes, what she does is she tempts and she tricks and she tries to lure and pull them in. And you can look at the different ways that society and the government is described in chapter 17 in the beginning. I mean, you can see adultery all over the place, sexual pleasure all over the place. You can see intoxication of wine all over the place. And then you skip down and in verse 3, it begin, in verse 4, it begins to describe purple and scarlet, which means riches and royalty glittering with gold precious stones pearls she held a golden cup in her hand all of the temptations of materialism and selfishness are laced all throughout this You see, what chapter 17 describes is this temptation of false hope in the society and the government. And he says, listen, you need to be prepared because it's going to be strong. She's going to look good, real good. She's going she's gonna to be real good at tempting you. She's going to know the exact buttons to push. She's going to say the right things at just the right time. But she's going to have a heart of ice. You see, the prostitute, the whore, is symbolizing the false hope 
in the world instead of Jesus. And it comes in a couple different ways. One is this false hope in the government. It's false hope in the government that these people were experiencing. Rome constantly was, fa- was pushing persecution on the churches. And they knew they were not going to find their hope in their government. It was a corrupt and tainted system that hated Christians. And so there wasn't going to be hope there, but there was the temptation for the early churches so they didn't face persecution, so they didn't face death, to kind of blend in and to pick up part of that government system and find hope in it. And friends, I, I want to be real clear. I, I, love, I love the country I live in. I love the land that I live in. I love where I'm at. I love standing before a baseball game with the flag flying in the outfield. I love that moment. But as followers of Jesus, if we pledge our allegiance before kneeling to the throne of Jesus, we have lost track of our hope. If our hope and our Savior is found in a White House or a Capitol building or any other building, then we've lost our hope. Our hope is not found in any system of this world. Our hope is found in Christ alone. That's the only place where things will be made right because even in the highest forms of government in our world, they're still living in the fall. And I'm not saying we don't pledge our allegiance. I'm not saying we don't sing the songs. I'm not saying any of that. But what I am saying is that Christ should come first. Because otherwise, it will be hopeless. The second form of temptation. The second form that Revelation chapter 17 is pushing towards is this selfish deception of sexual immorality and materialism. The cultural norm during this time period was to focus on self. And so there's this preparation moment to say, listen, this is what culture is going to try to lure you into. You experience it, you love it, you keep doing it, feels good, run after it. As long as it satisfies you. The problem is is that when we live a life focused on selfish desires and sexual immorality, we will lose life. Because all we're doing is just holding puppets and eventually we will grow tired. The puppets of materialism and sexual immorality will grow old. And we will grow lifeless. And it's in these moments, friends, in these moments where we need to refocus and ask ourselves, is this a puppet that I'm trying to hold up or is this a king that I'm trying to praise? Right now, if we were to look at our cries, if we were to look at our lives and evaluate for just a brief moment, would we say that our lives are filled more with cries and complaints or praise and perseverance? You see, what What John is trying to communicate, what God is communicating through John, which is our truth for this morning, is that our hope, friends, is found in our perseverance towards Jesus. That's the only place that our hope will be found. Our hope is not found in puppets. There's punishment for puppets. Our hope is not found in in the systems of this world. They will crumble. Our hope is not found in how we can please ourselves and feel good because eventually that will grow old and we will grow lifeless. And while Satan tries to say, hey, pick me up, John is writing God's revelation to say, no, I will not pick it up. It won't be today. Today will not be the day. 1 Peter chapter 5. Beginning in verse 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind, opposite, opposite of the temptation of Revelation 17. Be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers through the wor- throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And here it is, friends. And the God of all grace, 
who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. You see, friends, we will face difficult times. We will face temptations. We will face cultural pressure. We will face society that wants to persecute and argue. And it's in those moments that we remember that our hope is found in our perseverance towards Jesus. I brought one more puppet this morning. This is an actual accurate depiction based on biblical record of the... I'm just kidding, it's not. <laughs> just in case you're confused. I didn't know we had this guy up there until I was looking for some of these other guys. Sometimes, sometimes I think we have turned Satan into almost just a kid's puppet. That's not that big of a deal. Like we, we legitimately have justified our sin into being as comfortable as a kid's puppet. And we give him a little goatee and some horns and we call it good. And like, oh, that's Satan, rawr. But in actuality, in actuality, this puppet is trying to steal every ounce of life that is inside of you. He's trying to convince you that you're worthless, that you have no purpose. He's trying to distract you. Say, hey, pick up one of my friends. Pick up one of my friends over here. They're, they're really fun. And friends, this morning, there just needs to be almost a little bit of the uncomfortable, harsh reality that there's punishments for puppets who dance with the whore. And there will come a time, there will come a time when we won't be able to set down the puppets anymore. Like that's what Revelation is for. It's, it's this preparation book. Because Jesus loves us enough and wants us to see him clearly, he, he gives us this last book to prepare us to say, listen friends, it's going to happen, come on. There will come a day when we can't justify a way. There will come a day when we can't set down these puppets. There will come a day where this guy wins for some, but not all. There will come a day when we don't get the chance to set down the puppet anymore. And that will be the moment that Revelation chapter 14 warns us that the day of judgment is coming. And that's not meant to scare us, but it certainly should be to warn us. That our lives each day when we wake up it should be filled with the grace and the mercy of Jesus, but also the recognition of, no, Satan, today I'm not going to pick that up. No, I'm not going to pick up worry today. I'm going to leave it on the counter. Not today. And no, say, I'm not going to pick up my selfishness today. I'm not going to do it. I know you want me to. No, no, saying today, I'm not going to pick up that sexual temptation. I'm not going to pick up the pornography. I'm not picking it up. Not today. No, saying, I'm not picking up walking away from my marriage. I'm not doing it. I'm not picking it up today. Saying I'm not picking up the puppet that says that you've won because life is hard and I've lost people. I'm not doing it. I'm not picking up, I'm not picking up the puppet of anxiety and depression. I'm not gonna pick it up today. I'm not gonna let you win. I'm not gonna dance today, Satan. Not today. Because today, 
My hope is found in my perseverance towards Jesus. And is it difficult? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. Does it take work? Yes. But will we meet our King when we do? Yes. Because our hope in all of this difficulty of society and culture is found in our perseverance to Jesus. We will never find eternal hope anywhere except for at the foot of the cross. Our hope is found in our perseverance towards Jesus. Why don't we go ahead and stand together? This morning, we're going to worship. This morning, as we, as we worship together, there are some of us that are holding puppets. There are some of us that are holding puppets of all the things that I just gave examples of or others. And maybe others know, and maybe it's our deepest, darkest secret right now. And Satan wants to convince you to keep it a secret. Don't let anyone else know. Just keep doing it. And this morning as we worship, I guarantee you, you're not the only one holding a puppet this morning. Guarantee it. You're not alone in the struggle. Jesus has not walked away. His grace did not run out. He still sees you as valuable, that you have a purpose. And maybe this morning, some of us, we need to set down the puppets. Maybe for some of us this morning, who we live with or work with or have grown kids that are now holding on to puppets and the perseverance is at an all-time high. Maybe this morning, you recognize that all week long, Satan has been luring and tempting and tricking to pull you in trying to tell you to pick up just pick one up, it's good and maybe this morning as we worship and as we celebrate a Jesus that is standing right next to us maybe even under our breath we say no I'm not picking that up Satan because I serve a king who has already won our hope this morning friends Our hope is not found in anything that we have in our hands. Our hope is found in our perseverance towards Jesus, our King. Let's worship together.